Do you love going to Broadway shows, but can't go now because Broadway's closed? Join tour guide Tim and Velasco too as they bring Broadway history to you. Grab your Broadway passport for what's in store on your virtual Broadway tour. This week's theater, the Eugene O'Neill, opened in 1925 as part of the Schubert's continued expansion on 48th and 49th Streets that they had begun in 1921 with the Ritz, now the Walter Kerr, and the Ambassador. Continuing with the use of their star architect, Herbert J. Kraft, this new theater differed from the others by including a hotel complex in the theater's design. When the theater and hotel opened on November 24th, 1925, they were called The Forest to honor noted 19th century actors. Edwin Forrest. For theater historians, Edwin Forrest's name conjures up one of the bloodiest riots in New York City history dating back to 1849. A fierce rivalry had developed between American actor Forrest and British actor William Charles McCready, who were both known for their Shakespearean portrayals. It all came to a head downtown at Astor Place, very near where the public theater sits today, when both Forrest and McCready were scheduled to perform Macbeth in separate productions at two theaters just blocks from each other. When British and American sympathies already were strained, the militia was called as opposing factions of theatergoers took to the streets. Shots rang out, and when the dust settled, nearly 30 rioters were killed, all over a dramatic theater rivalry. Sad. With the forest name on the marquee, the theater got off to a very rocky start. Except for a few shows that ran over 100 performances, the first five years produced many flops. But in 1935, the play transferred to the theater and would become the second longest running play in Broadway history, Tobacco Road. For six years at the forest, the show featured an envelope-pushing depiction of rural poverty, portrayed in a naturalistic way. As it turns out, urban audiences were curious to see how the other half lived. This led to other notable hits that settled in at the theater. While Arthur Miller's Broadway debut was here at the Forest with The Man Who Had All the Luck in 1944, sadly, it only ran four performances. But his All My Sons opened here just three years later and marked the first major success. Musicals would also fare well throughout the later decades of the theater's history. Hit musicals included the original She Loves Me, starring Barbara Cook, Big River in 1985, Grease Revival in 1994, The Full Monty, Spring Awakening, and the current tenant, The Book of Mormon. Architect Herbert J. Crapp intended to build a medium-sized theater that could accommodate both plays and musicals, and indeed, it has. The Forest has undergone a few name changes and many different owners over the years. In 1945, the theater was renamed the Coronet when it came under new management. In 1959, the theater was again renamed to honor legendary American playwright Eugene O'Neill, who was actually born just a few blocks away in a hotel room of the Barrett House in 1888. The hotel was later demolished and is now a Starbucks. In the late 1960s, the theater was bought by playwright Neil Simon, whereupon he produced 10 of his own shows there. And then, in 1982, the current owner, Ju Jamson, purchased the theater from Neil Simon for approximately $4 million and set about looking for a hit show to fill in. Enter country music tunesmith Roger Miller. He was tasked with penning a few tunes for an adaptation of Huckleberry Finn. Big River, as it was later called, opened at the O'Neill to mixed reviews, but one review came from Walter Kerr at the New York Times that saved the show. Big River won the Tony Award for Best Musical that year and was a hit with a two-year run on Broadway helping put Hugh Jamson on a path to success. In fact, they were so thankful for that review that during renovations of their Ritz Theater, they changed the name to the Walter Kerr. You can't possibly talk about all of the hit productions of the Eugene O'Neill throughout its 95-year history without also mentioning one other notable production. Notable for all the wrong reasons. Moose Murders. 
For many years, it was the benchmark for Broadway at its worst. Written by playwright Arthur McNeil, the murder mystery farce was set in a camping lodge and originally starred Hollywood legend Eve Arden in a return to Broadway. Sadly, she had a hard time memorizing her lines and backed out after the first preview, quickly replaced by Holland Taylor. New York Times critic Frank Rich remarked in his review that there will now always be two groups of theater goers in this world, those who have seen Moose Murders and those who have not. How long did it run, you ask? Well, its opening night party at Sardi's was also its closing night. But there's still a remnant of the show nearby in the theater district. The poster hangs on the flop wall at Joe Allen's restaurant, immortalized as one of Broadway's biggest disasters. And if you're feeling daring, you'll have to try the Murder Moose cocktail. They created it to honor the show. It's made of Sambuca, lime juice, olive juice, and garnished with an onion and a cherry. Cheers. Hello! Happy Saturday noon on Broadway. How are you doing? Can you believe that it's week 26 of this journey that we're on of 41 weeks? It feels insane that we are, we've made it this far, but we have made it this far. Uh, happy Saturday noon on Broadway. I hope you all had a glorious uh, week of our Eugene O'Neill stuff. My name is Tim Dolan. For those who don't know me, welcome uh, to this part of our virtual Broadway tour series. Every week we're coming to you live with someone who's worked at the theater we featured that week. And this week we are joined by the incredible, the very funny, the very fancy uh, Jacob Heron from the Book of Mormon at the Eugene O'Neill Theater. For those that really aren't familiar with me or Broadway up close, what we do is we tell you all the secrets, the history, the fun facts, the ghost stories, all the things you didn't know, you didn't know that you really want to know about the 41 Broadway theaters in New York City. For the last 10 years, my green team and I, uh, composed of stage managers and actors, um, we are your theatrical eyes uh, to the world of our weird, insane theater lives, uh, theater doing, your theater going life. Um, we have five exterior tours that we offer uh, as in addition to our interior tour of the Hudson Theater, which is Broadway's oldest. We also own a gift shop uh, in the middle of Times Square, currently stationed in front of Lion King with a six foot tall Broadway sign made of 150 light bulbs, spelling out my favorite word, which is Broadway. And so all of that uh, was impacted, of course, by COVID-19 as uh, it impacted all of our lives. So our gift shop's closed, that is all moved online, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, and then our exterior tours, we're still offering those uh, with masks in person, but then we also have a whole series of virtual tours. In addition to this free virtual tour, um, we have actual uh, paid ticketed events uh, that are me live in front of this wall, telling you all kinds of fancy things from the comfort of my couch to your lazy boy. So check out our website, www.broadwayupclose.com for the info on all of that, should you be very interested. Um, when this all started on March 12th, I initially thought, I think like most did, that it'll just be a couple of weeks and then we'll be back to work and it'll be all really great. Uh, so here we are. Uh, over, uh, you know, coming up on 10 months, what I think will be, I think we're maybe like a little over halfway. So we're uh, we're trucking along one day closer to Broadway. So I thought we'll go online, we'll do one theater a week. That'll be 41 theaters, 41 weeks. By the time we're done, it'll be March, 2021. And in my mind, I was like, then we'll definitely be reopened. But as we know, that's not even the case. So here we are. Um, this week, uh, we have the Eugene O'Neill. I hope you've enjoyed all the history and the fun facts this week. How is today gonna work? For the next uh, 35, 40 minutes, uh, we'll talk and learn all about Jacob's theatrical journey, his time working, of course, on the Book of Mormon at the Eugene O'Neill. If you have any questions for him or me along the way, drop those in the comments. And um, I forgot to put it in the comment, but if you have, uh, if you're here live, hi, uh, drop and let me know where you're watching from and give me a little hello in the comments um, so we know where you're, where our stories are going today. And so without further ado, welcome, happy Saturday noon on Broadway, and join me in welcoming Broadway's Jacob Heron. Hey! <laughs> yeah, how are you? Broadway history nerd. Oh, yeah, sporting the merch, my favorite type of human. Yes, always on brand. We love that. I literally, I just went to your, um, your your Instagram page because I was like, I want to know facts about the Eugene O'Neill. Like, I haven't <laughs> been on the social media very much. So, uh, yeah, we got to. Posting that all week. 
Yeah, you um, for good reasons. Uh, you should yeah. not be on social media. It's uh, a dark pit of despair at times today. Not my channel though. My channel is like happy and sunshine. I was like, it's oh, gonna yeah. be fine. <laughs> it's all gonna be fine. We're all dying, but it's all gonna be great. Um, yeah. yeah, the Eugene O'Neill. You had some some of the best hits uh, ever. Arthur Miller's Broadway debut and his great shows. She loves me. Full Monty, Spring Awakening, Big River, yeah. and then you had Moose Murders. Do you know about Moose Murders? Wait, I've heard of, is Moose Murders like the legendary terror yes. show? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you'll have yeah. to go check out yesterday's episode. We did a, a one minute on Moose Murders and it's uh, it opened and closed on opening night at Sardi's. They learned they were closing. Um, <laughs> and it is one of, there's a whole book about it. I read the book years ago. I summed up that entire book in one minute for our video. And it is um, oh my God. one of the most absurd experiences you've ever heard in your entire life. And uh, I was at an audition uh, while I was reading this. I was at an audition for a dance call. And it said the music director in it was Ken Lundy. And that was the guy playing the the audition, the dance call, the callback I was at. And I walked in and I was like, Ken, Ken, I'm reading this book. You did this? And he was like, oh, my gosh. As he's like, ga 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 and in between breaks, I'd be like, you're in it. It's crazy. Tell me everything. And he was like, it was the most insane thing I've ever done in my life. Um, yeah, crazy. Um, rest in peace, Ken Lundy. He passed away, I think, oh two God. years ago. Um, but here we are. Um, okay, oh, let's no. talk about you. Shall we? I know. You're just like, I was like, oh, yeah. we lost Ken. Let's talk about you. Um, okay, so tell us, <laughs> for those who don't know you, um, tell us everything about your life um, pre-New York. So tell us uh, where you grew up, maybe when you first got exposed to theater and were like, that's a thing I like. And then maybe yeah. if you did kids, uh, children's theater, if you went to school for it, get us like your bio in a nutshell to get to New York City. Yeah, great. It's a lot. Well, I grew up in a, um, I, <laughs> I grew up in a <laughs> baseball family. Um, my dad was a, was a baseball player in the minor leagues and my mom and him worked for the Dodgers together. So not a creative arts family at all, which I think is sure. important Hilarious. to tell people because you don't just need to have a parent that like was a like concert pianist. Um, <laughs> but then I just was singing all the time with my lovely sister Deidre, which is how I met you because you guys ended up doing a show together later on. Yeah. So uh, when but, uh, I was thinking today, so we, I worked with Deidre, your older sister in 2007 on the Wizard of Oz the first time mm -hmm. I did it. And I, I met you, presumably you came to see the show. Is that the first time I met yeah. you? Yeah. Which means Probably, you were like, yeah. you were like maybe, how old were you in 2007? You look really great. Um, I, was, I was in high school. So yeah. Like 15 maybe. Yeah, that's yeah, what I was thinking. 14, I was like, I think it was 15. like 15. So you look great. You still yeah. got it. Oh, thank um, you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, correct. Um, yeah, so that, okay, so that's wild. You. <laughs> Thank you. You're like, but the book up. it's still there. It's still there. Right. Um, yeah. So when um, you were 15, I met you, and and I remember learning about your family and your sister's ridiculously talented. And then she was like, "Oh, my brother sings too. He's also really talented." And I was like, "Well, if he's anything like you, I'm sure this is going to go well." And so I kind of kept tabs on you for years and years. And you were like, "Oh, it's going really well. This is going well. This is good for him. This is good." Um, okay, so but mostly a sports family, which blows my mind because yeah. two of how many of you? There are four of you. Four yeah, kids. I have three other siblings, and I mean, my mom. Like we grew up around music. You know, my mom like loved music, and my dad. Sure actually does have a nice voice, but like not, they didn't know anything. So <laughs> our first show we ever did was for this, we auditioned for this youth production of Annie just cause we were like singing all the time and they were kind of like, we need an outlet for these kids. And so like, it was, I feel like this dates me a little bit but they found the audition from an ad in the paper. Like, sure. Like the, like the real person <laughs> paper. That was like this you were like, like doing Annie. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then we were hooked and then like very quick, you know, I'm, but I'm from San Diego, so it's a big theater town. So it was like the right. moment you do one thing, somebody's like, oh, well, we're all now going to audition to this show and now we're going to go up audition for this. And, um, you know, very quickly I became like obsessed with musical theater, went yeah. to college at UC Irvine, um, major same, uh, same as Deidre. Yeah. Same as Deidre. And then yeah. some of our, no some of our like notable alumni, um, cause we don't make these like top playbill lists and they, those playbill lists make me so mad. Cause I'm like, you don't have to go to like Michigan just to be on Broadway. Like, you Correct. Yeah. 
So um, we had Teal Wicks go to our school, who was an alphabet. Duh, um, and the share Jen, and the share show. Right, right. As um, you Jen do. Kalala. We love Jen Kalala. Yeah. She loves UC Irvine. Um, and uh, of course, Beth Malone, Tony Winner yes. um, from Fun Home went to UC Irvine. Um, so we have some good. Some good, some good peeps. That and went to Jacob UCI. Heron went yeah. to UCI. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Yeah. And did and then, you, with Deidre having done it professionally and still doing it professionally with an entire family of her own, which boggles my mind, um, she was it. She she laid down kind of groundwork uh, and railroad tracks for like this is how you can do it? Was it like, I'm going to follow in her footsteps and do similar things to her? Or is it like, it, coincidentally, because the school was there and that's where she went? Like, talk to me about having a sibling who is already doing what you want to do because not right. a lot of people get that opportunity. You know, we like, because I had two other siblings that weren't in theater, we really could only do shows if they were, if we were both in them. You know, so like so much because my mom was just like, I can't drive like four children everywhere. Right. <laughs> so we will, we will too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we would we did most of our like journey together, honestly. Um, so it was pretty obviously she had to be the guinea pig. And so she was, you know, the first one to go to college, first one to move to New York. So um, I don't think that it was, we were actually lucky enough to like be in like the kids in some professional shows in San Diego. So we had worked with like really amazing, like professional actors. Like I did, I grew up doing shows with Eric Anderson, who has now done like several Broadway shows and was like a sure. waitress and stuff. But he was like the local guy that like got the leads in all the shows when I was like in San Diego. Um, so but it was, it definitely made that move to New York easier. And just like, you know, I, when she got an agent, I met with her agent, um, you right. know, but then we've kind of, you know, we've kind of now that we're both adults had our own journeys. Um, for sure. You know, but yeah, Crazy. it definitely made it easier for me. <laughs> and did you like, um, I'm always intrigued about the college experience. Did you like your college musical theater experience? Did you like um, the schooling? Did you feel like it it prepared you for when you finally got to New York City? Yeah, you know, I, I have a bit of a, I'll be completely honest, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with my college, but also just like certain college programs in general, I think that some BFA programs need a bit of a revolution and especially in this time, you know, as far as representation and stuff like that. But what I loved about my college is that we were not, um, we, we all had to apply and get into the college based on our grades and just like normal college. It was right. not an audition program. And then, so I was accepted into the college as a BA in drama. And then I had to apply for the BFA program while I was there. Okay. Now, some colleges will um, will do that, but it's like they do these like jury things, I think, and they'll sure. like eliminate people from the program. Whereas my yeah. college, like nobody was eliminated from the program. It's just that then you applied for the BFA in musical theater. And if you were okay. accepted into that program, you had additional classes that you needed to take. So sure. like I have a friend who did not make it into the BFA program, but took every single class as me except one hilarious um, so it's like you know weird like college red tape but my yeah. college also um all that's to say is that what i liked about my college is that they really didn't cast us they weren't like well we need a tenor and then we need a soprano sure. and we need like our person of color like they really just like wanted to curate an educational experience for us and our needs and what we wanted to do so like i really wanted more dance um, another person in my class, she took like all the Shakespeare, like nerdy acting classes. That's what she wanted. So <laughs> sure. it was like a bit of a choose your own adventure, which I think was a really, really um, huge positive to the experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is, yeah, which is, yeah, of course has its pluses and minuses, but a lot of pluses, um, mm -hmm. you know, the minuses of sometimes it's like when you're choosing your own adventure, sometimes you, you're, you're like, I'm only 19. I don't know. I think I want to choose this adventure. That's going to be beneficial, but sometimes you want, you know, uh, sometimes you just, I don't know, sometimes in this world, I feel like, just tell me what you want. You know, you've done it. Just tell me I need to go to the gym more. Okay. I'm going to go to right. the gym and 
and right. focus more on this or, you know, um, so, right, right, but right. that's great. So then you finish yeah. college um, and then you move right to New York City. What happens right after college? Um, well, and actually, before we leave college, I did just want to plug one thing about my college, which is that the best thing that UCI does is this whole New York program. So you apply uh, yeah. and then you go to New York for like two months and like take classes and all of that. And I feel like they're the only college that really does that. So that was a huge advantage to the program because just and, like learning how to use the subway, like stuff like that. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's silly, but it's, uh, yeah. And I, yeah, I've heard a couple, even, uh, programs that like have classes at their school about when you get there, but, but the added advantage of this is like, well, no, 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 we're going to have that class, but while you're on the subway. Yeah, uh, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna on the train. <laughs> Correct. Everyone class booked yeah. out. Uh we have four <laughs> stops to go. Let's uh let's do this and go. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh we've had a couple it's been a minute, I think, and this year, gosh knows everything's different, but uh, we've done um some tours for that satellite program. Um so oh, as great. part of their curriculum, we uh we have been like, okay, and for one of your classes, come on a tour. And it's always my favorite because so they're great. like you just got here and you're like thoroughly modern Millie and you're setting down the suitcases and it's like the world yeah, is your yeah. oyster. I love that totally. energy. Um, yeah. Great. But okay. Then, so then, yeah, so then what happened? Yeah. So <clears throat> I did have like a bit of a Cinderella story with like after college and ba basically I, which I like to throw in the parts that are not the Cinderella story. So I did not get an agent from showcase. Like nothing came from showcase for me at all. Great. And then randomly, um, I get like a random phone call from an agent that was like, uh, we're looking to submit people for this project. And like, so-and-so gave us, you know, your name, um, are you available? And it was like, like a Barbie international tour or some, some like weird project. And I was like, I'm not really interested in it. And then the agent was like, well, why didn't I get invited to your showcase? Like, I didn't even know about it. And I was like, good question. Um, so I had a meeting with him. And, uh, you know, we were like, okay, we'll work together. And then he got me an audition for Rock of Ages in Vegas and I booked it. So I booked my first audition with this agent. <laughs> Come on. Which for and those who are like, watching, that does not happen. That does not happen. No, and never. It was like, it was, it was also like the audition that like, it was like the next day and I had 50 pages of material. I of didn't course. know anything and was like totally went in. And I think, that's probably why I got it. Cause I went in and just had no context, did my own thing was like, this is never going to happen, you know, put no pressure on it. And I was literally, when he called me, he was like, you got it. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> I was like, not prepared to move to Vegas anyways. So wow. Did and what did you, in Rock of Ages, what did you do? What uh, you covered, was, you played, I was and what did you do? An on, yeah, it was an on stage swing, um, okay. which I feel like we don't like, is not really a thing. So basically like I was in the show every night, but like would fill in all of the holes of um, yeah. like, you know, what was there. And then I also did cover Drew, the lead um, and like two of the other um, like ensemble tracks. Crazy. So. After this, everyone who's following along and watching live after this, you're going to go to YouTube and type, a, type in Jacob Heron and hear the best, highest, glorious voice you've ever heard in your life. And then you're going to know why he walked into one audition and his like voice fell out. They were like, do you want to do Drew? And he was like, Vegas, I guess. Um, it's all going to make more sense when you look at the videos. Yeah. Um, okay. So then you do Rock of Ages. How long were you in Vegas for? I don't a year. remember. A year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then um, you're like back to New York. Well, I had still never moved to New York at this point. So, oh. um, yeah. Cause I got it right after college. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. And then also like I was in this weird, I, cause again, I, I like am really passionate about highlighting these like non-traditional stories. So I was at a point yeah. where I like had achieved my childhood dream, like right before my senior year of college by getting a job at Disneyland, which was like, see, so you can see my like Mickey life here. I'm like, <laughs> like everything you Disney. live for. Yes. Yeah. Like I live for Disney. So I was, and I opened this new show at Disneyland and because I was in a union show there, like I was making like adult money, didn't have to take out a loan my senior year of college, you know? And, um, and I was like, and I coincided my class schedule. So I actually would work. I would on Mondays from Rock of Ages, I would drive back to California to work at Disney just because I like loved it so much. Like I'm crazy. 
And so then I got to this point after Rock of Ages, I went back to California and I was like, you know, I feel like I kind of just want to like go to New York for these big auditions, then like really move there and like do this hustle because I'm so happy here in California. Yeah. And I was like, and I'm making good money and providing for myself to like, I'll fly to New York for the Newsies national tour that I wanted to be in um, sure. for Book of Mormon, stuff like that. So then while I was in California, I did um, just a regional production of Catch Me If You Can um, at the theater I grew up doing shows at, Moonlight and Vista. Okay. Somebody at the La Jolla Playhouse saw that and they were like, you're really good. You should come in for this show that we're doing, this new musical. And then I did uh, the musical Up Here at La Jolla Playhouse, which was written by Bobby and Kristen Lopez, who are now like, EGOT, you know, Bobby's an EGOT. Um, and, uh, you know, wrote Frozen and all that, directed by Alex Timbers. Like, it was like this stacked Come on. creative team. Um, and the show was, whoo, it was a fun one. Was it <laughs> any I, good? I mean, it was... So it was, the concept was that it was like, what's going on inside this guy's head as he's like right. meeting this girl and stuff. And it actually came out the same time as Inside Out. So oh, with the movie, so okay. it was like kind of weird timing because Inside Out was so brilliant. And then our show was like just super <laughs> zany and weird. There was like tap dancing cactuses, like sure. it was just, they were figuring sure. a lot out, you know. <laughs> so, going really well. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, like, it was, there were some really great moments in it, but like, you know, it was just, it was all over the place. Sure. Um, and, and the so cast then, was great, if I remember. Yeah, uh, so who Betsy else? Wolf was the That's lead right. in that. And then yeah. um, Eric Peterson, who's like, I'm uh -huh. like a huge fan of, and I love him as a person who was like in School of Rock. And um, yeah, and he, uh, wasn't he in uh, Escape to Margaritaville? Is that him? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And actually, he's going to be um, starring opposite uh, Annie Murphy, who was Alexis in Schitt's Creek in a new TV show. They're like, husband. oh my gosh. Yeah. Crazy. So, super talented. So, um, so uh, this is this is also just a fun story. So basically, oh, so opening night happens up here at the opening night party. Bobby Lopez says to me, like, we next thing we got to do is, like, get you in for Book of Mormon. And I was like, oh, you're just saying that. Like, that's, you know what I mean? Like, because in, in this business, there's such schmoozy kind of stuff like that. You don't, you know. Yeah. But he's, he's like, the nicest person ever. And I, I'm such a fan of his. He's so sweet. But I was like, okay, whatever. Well, I leave the opening night party to drive up to L.A. because I have a red eye to New York for a callback for Jack in Newsies on the national tour. Come on. <laughs> So I go, I'm like, literally my eyes are red. Like I just like went through technique. A literal red eyes. eyes. <laughs> Crazy show. Yeah. I, I have this, I think I was in the room for like 30 minutes to an hour. Like I did, ev I did every side, like all five sides. They taught me a song on the spot. Like I was like, this is happening, blah, 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 leave. They say, okay, great. Can you come back for the producer call on Friday? And I was like, no. No. <laughs> No, the answer is no. I was like, literally uh, no. And like, I asked my stage manager, he was just like, this is a new musical. There's no way. And especially in this kind of show that was so insane, like with, right. we all had crazy costumes. So they were like, but you know, I guess you, we, they also weren't filming the callback, which Disney should have been filming the callback. So they were like, can you make a tape for this producer or whatever? And I was like, sure. Yes, sure. sure. So yeah. in between shows, I spend like, two and a half oh then okay so so this all happens i get back to california the next day i get an appointment for book of mormon to make a tape <laughs> great so so then the, then in two days we have two shows and so in between shows i like buy my friends lunch and i'm like we got i have these two tapes to make so i spend like probably like two hours making this newsies tape and i was like and then i have this book of mormon one let's just you know Hey, bang it out yeah made it made it in 30 minutes and, then, and for uh, those who are watching we haven't <laughs> talked a lot about self-tapes over the 25 weeks we've been together virtually self-tapes are like the new thing of the world especially now but like even before covid it's it became it was starting to get more and more like well you just put yourself on tape and do all of it and hire a reader and get film equipment and have a setup in your apartment that looks professional and looks good and you know, have good lighting, and then we'll maybe watch it. 
Yeah. And you spend hours doing this and you're like, I don't even think they watched it. And you're yeah, like, oh. YouTube, YouTube has changed it, but you used to be able to see exactly the location of where your tapes were viewed. So you could like see who yeah. and how many views came out of the New York area. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. one view, great, yeah. worth it. Right. And I actually Correct. do remember clicking on the Book of Mormon one and it had like 13 or something. And I was like, that's weird. You like booked it. Oh, but no, I yeah. really did. <laughs> yeah, so so then, then you really do. You book it. So then I got it from that. You got team, it. Which like literally never happens. Like no. it, was just, it was just this crazy timing of like, I had just done the show with Bobby. This track had just opened up. He was like, this tenor is great. And like. Gosh, <laughs> and you got it. Which um, which elder do you? Uh, so this was on the. So you got the tour, right? This was the tour, or this was Broadway. I can't remember. This now. was this was the tour. This was okay. the tour. So and you did the tour for how point. long? Yeah, I did the tour from um, like October twenty seventh to like August two, almost two years later. So I was there for like okay. almost two years on the tour. Wow, and you loved it. Do you love the show? Do you yeah, tell me everything? I, yeah, it was, I mean, actually, I I brought this for you all today. This is my name. Today. Oh, like, <laughs> come on. I'm obsessed. Yeah, oh. I, um, there is a story behind that. Uh, I'll get to you, but um, sure. yeah, it was, it was magical. Like what, I, like, I will say that about the tour, like it was, it was really great people. And also like, we were like, in some ways that tour felt more like Broadway because we were like, you know, it was at the, it was at a time when we were staying in cities for like six weeks. Yeah. So like we yeah. were like, could, in like these... enjoy a city. Yeah. Get to like, know a city. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, I'm, I know that this is the case on other tours, but like when we went to Houston and Texas, they gave us like a private tour of NASA. It was just like, you know, sure. you're like treated like royalty yeah. um, and you're like, that didn't happen on the tour that I did of gentlemen prefer blondes for some reason. <laughs> Um, a tour of gentlemen from Duh, big break. We oh called it the first God. national, but that's only because the original Broadway production didn't go on tour. <gasps> no way. We said we're the first national gentleman for blobs. The first time it ever has gone on tour, and there's good reason. Um, but we didn't get the private tour of NASA. I think I had to like book a <laughs> regular ticket. So you're welcome. Uh, you're nailing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, like, what do you mean we didn't get like, a private group rate? Right? <laughs> They also spoiled us because like they like booked a bus to like take us to NASA. You know what I mean? And also yeah. I think it was specifically like the company manager on that tour is a company manager that's been on a lot of tours and he really goes out of his way to like make like the tour a family and take care of us. Even my first Thanksgiving on tour was, you know, it was pretty shortly after I had joined and we were in Philadelphia and he like booked us this like a spot and this like historic restaurant in Philadelphia that like the founding fathers would like gather at. So we had this like candlelit dinner with all of this food that was made like without preservatives, like the way old food was made. And it was like, Come it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. It was wow. so ridiculous. Yeah. It's good um, to have those, those company managers, especially on those tours. Uh, they know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. It's, those are the and, people to, yeah. And meanwhile, my plan worked because at this point I've still never lived in New York. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, so now you're like, okay, uh, will I ever get there? So yeah, you yeah. get there at, on the heels of them saying, why don't you be in the Broadway company? How does it go from, how do you go from tour Philadelphia, like giving thanks over non-preservative filled <laughs> Turkey to Eugene O'Neill theater? Yeah. It's, you know, I will say, I will just pause and say that like, this industry has so many ups and downs and it's so easy to get wrapped up in the downs. And so at a time when like we're all unemployed and I've like, you know, had to move out of the city, it's funny telling these stories back. Cause I'm like, I had a pretty great journey. Like, no, it, pretty the highs are highs. The lows are lows right now. We're yeah. in the lowest of low, but yeah. I just haven't I, focused on these highs in a long yeah. time. And I know it is. Like, you have oh, I must sound yeah. really obnoxious. No, this is the point. The point is, yeah is to talk about the the highs and the lows but but to really to knit together kind of 
That's why I love just tell me how where we started and how we got to here because yeah. it's it's fun for us to watch a, a successful journey and the weird turns that don't feel as successful and then a global right. pandemic which makes us all feel like garbage humans as artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it is it, it's you have to you have to look at the highs in the past and cherish them in a moment like yeah, this or else you totally. will curl up in a bed underneath your Mickey Mouse light and never leave. <laughs> um, like, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna work on that. Um, okay, yeah. so so yeah, so the highs are highs, and then yeah. they so what they just say, let's go to New York. This track opens. Let's go. So it was. It became pretty clear to me that like that the dynamics were as such that it was kind of rare for them to just invite people to the Broadway company, and I don't. I've never asked specifically what their reasoning for that is, but I know that that's the case with some companies. They very much, and at this point too, in the Book of Mormon world, like it was the same contract. So there was no, obviously people want to go to Broadway because they want to be on Broadway, but like, you know, it's, they viewed them all as completely equal companies. So it's, it's work for them to move people, you know, yeah. to a different company. Um, and, you know, they want to avoid that at all, at all costs. Um, sure. So basically it was just getting to the point I was ready to leave tour. Um, and I wanted to like pursue New York and so I thought I'm going to leave the tour and I'm going to leave. Um, the tour was going to San Diego. And I was like, I want to leave the tour, have my closing night in my hometown with all my family and friends. So I put my notice on tour. And then like a week later, I get like word from the Broadway company that my track has also put in his notice. Come on. Like, coincidentally. So a friend of mine in the Broadway company, like, you know, called me in the way that like, nobody's supposed to know things in theater, but everybody knows everything kind of way was like, your track, just put in his notice, you need to like, call your agent immediately. So then I wrote them and was like, I know I said that I'm ready to leave the tour, but right. <laughs> I really like the Broadway cast. Um, so I was, you know, they kept saying like, you know, they, we think it's gonna happen, we think it's gonna happen. Not, never heard anything. I waited like months. So like close the close the tour. I'm at my parents' house. And at this point, right, like I'm at my parents' house, like packing up all my stuff like for the first time. Right. You know, because I was like, okay, I'm gonna move to New York. Like still like I think I may have a job. I'm not sure. And then I finally got the call and um Crazy. that I would be making my Broadway debut at the show. Crazy. So. And do you remember, so having, it's an interesting thing when you've already done a show for a very long time and then yeah. you do, a, it's your Broadway debut. And it, it, a lot of people have said it feels like another tour stop because you've played so many different theaters with the show. Do you specifically remember the first moment, the first curtain, the first hello uh, at the Eugene O'Neill? Yeah, I do. Um, it was, it it the the stage is so much smaller than tour so right. i do remember thinking like don't fall off the platform and hello because <laughs> right. i'm the one i'm the mormon that is like on the top platform in the center and i do the like hello oh like, come on yeah. yeah so like that's a really cool thing that's like you know my broadway debut was i got to say hello like oh, come on it was my first line on a broadway stage um but yeah uh. so i do remember but i will say what's funny is that like on tour, you know, they line up the seats um, kind of like behind the last backdrop. And it's just like, it looks like a dugout. So there's just all these seats with like your number. So like on tour, I was number 11. Um, whereas at the Eugene O'Neill, because it's so small, like I make my changes in five different places. So it's like at, at, on Broadway, like once the show starts, you go and that's it. Like you have no, and the dressing rooms are on the fourth floor. So once you leave the dressing room at the top of the show, you're never back. Right. So yeah. Like, you're like, I'm not just, walking up the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. So I just remember, I remember thinking like, I'm going to relish in this moment, but then remember thinking like, oh no, no, like I got to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like this is, this is feel like it's, uh, <laughs> um, Tom has a question. He says, uh, speaking of like backstage and all that, we love Tom. He says, Hey Jacob, I would guess in a show like Book of Mormon, there are a lot of fun backstage jokes and antics with uh, uh, assuming a small tight quarters uh, would lead, lead to that. Can you share some of your favorite moments or can you talk to us about like the recording booth, the offstage vocals in the stairwell, any of that insanity, yes. all of that. Tell us oh, all of that. So it's like, 
I don't know what other Broadway shows are like, but it's actually like ridiculous at Book of Mormon. It's almost exhausting how, like we have filled in every available gap with something. So to the point where um, for act one, the Mormon boys are all like in this downstage area, we call it the bunker, it's under the stage. And we have a like a made up board game with pieces that have our faces on them and okay. we have dice and um, basically we come up with like rules on the spot. Uh, so it's like a shoots and ladders board game. And we literally just like come up with stuff on the spot. Like you do this improv thing. And then like, if you do it well, like then you get to roll the dice and then whoever wins the game, you, they usually last about like two and a half weeks. Whoever wins the game has to buy donuts for us. <laughs> Or whoever, or sorry, whoever is in last when the yeah, I was like, wait, so the winner loses. Yeah. <laughs> wait, you know, like, the winner that is that has to like right. buy donuts. So like Treated. every Mormon boy, every swing has like a picture with their face on it that like the dressers made. It's like a thing. Wow. <laughs> um, wow. Th that's probably the biggest Crazy. one, but yeah. Crazy. And then the, all the offstage vocals. You know, uh, it really cut, it started with Promises, Promises of the Schubert was the first show to do offstage vocal enhancements with the ensemble when they weren't in the show uh, because it was, was Burt Bacharach, Hal David was 1960, something in the 60s. Um, so they didn't but it was have at, body mics though, right? Um, in the 60s, there was no body mics. No. So there was, uh, because Hal uh, David and Burt Bacharach became from the recording studio world, he was like, just having two people sing a song on stage is like, so it's, there's just not enough. It's not interesting. So he, but they set up a whole sound booth in the orchestra pit where these people sang oh. off stage. And that was the first time like vocal enhancements, which now is basically in almost every big show now, yeah. everyone's ooh, yeah. ooh, wah, wah, in the, in the wings. Right. Mormon, it's you're all in the stairwell, right? Because there's no place to put sound booths or vocal we are, booths. Or... We actually do smash into the wings. Um, oh, you do? I don't do, okay. yeah, I don't do the offstage vocals for Hasadiga um, because I'm the tenor track and those are like, Hasadiga, like I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't <laughs> Yeah, but then I believe we actually, because that's like probably the pretty, it's a pretty minimal like set number, you know what I mean? Like, um, we actually are like smashed into the wings and we all have at this point written like our own backup vocals, like in additions to the ones that are like, so if they left our mics on the whole time, you would hear like everything. <laughs> right. You're like, that's yeah. the audio feed I want. That's yeah. I think real. that's what's funny. Like when you're a replacement in a show and you come into that, you'll be like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> like when people yeah. start singing stuff like that, because everybody has these, and especially a show like this, that's, you know, it would have been the 10 year anniversary this spring. Like it's like, we still have a lot of original cast members in the show. Yeah, I was gonna say, there's some people who have been in it for a while. Yeah. So like there's right. a story, you know? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And I've always wondered because it feels a show like West Side Story where half the cast is jarks, uh, jarks, <laughs> jarks and chefs. Jarks and chefs. <laughs> uh, the jarks and chefs, my favorite, uh, my favorite game <laughs> on Broadway, where the cast is there's a literal divide. Talk to me about the dichotomy of having a whole bunch of character tap dancing white dudes who are non traditional ensemble people. And then the other half, half of the cast is in Africa and a lot of the scenes are separate until they become together. Does that, d does it lead to uh, clicks or things like that? Or is it in the I general mean, sense it all kind of blend together? We're all like a pretty like big family. Like I feel like I always try to make a point to, um, our, our dressing rooms are separated purely just for like logistical costume reasons, you know what I mean? Um, and because there's no crossover, like, uh, we you kind of have to make a point to go to the other side of the stage. So like, there's some of us that really make a point to try and see, you know, the other like half of the cast because um, there. That's one thing I liked about tour better is that you just saw people more and like there's no room to like hang out, right? So there are times where until the finale when we're all on stage together that I'll be like, oh, I didn't know show today. <laughs> Right. Like a swing, because you like haven't seen yeah. him in the in yeah. the building. Like in the baptism scene, I'll like go to baptize the person and be like, oh <laughs> that's uh yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and that's so, uh, I think I think people would could never uh, and anyone watching, you'll have to let us know. But that to me is like a thing 
that people can't wrap their mind around that you walk on stage and lock eyes with someone and you're like, Oh, I didn't know. Or you look at a conductor and you're like, Oh, I didn't know Chris was conducting today. And the fact that you can be doing a show in front of thousands of people and have these moments of like, Oh, I didn't know that was, Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like you don't like people, you show up to the theater, you go to your dressing room, you get ready. You're not like, it's not like everybody's in this big room before. Like I'm all ready to do a show. Like (laughs) have 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 a great show. Wednesday matinee. We are. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But um, I feel like intermission is the time when we really like are able to kind of at that point, everybody is kind of on a random spot in the theater to, you know, do their change. And they're making a huge change on stage because, you know, in in intermission, because the theater is so small. Yeah. They have to rotate the act one and act two sets. Um, Yeah. So it's pretty crazy, but crazy. Crazy. And so then March 12th happens and you, they're like, we're going to maybe take a break. Let's take a time out. So you were, where were you when you got the news? Were you on your way to work? Were you, what, where were you? No, I actually, I saw the writing on the wall. So um, March 11th, we were in the dressing room and we were getting to the point where we were like, we shouldn't be here. You know? Yeah. No stage scoring. Yeah. Like it's Um, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So then March 12th, I had a haircut with my friend. Um, A friend of mine is a barber in the city. And I literally was like, you can give me, you know, whatever haircut you want, because I'm sure we're not going to have a show. Literally. (laughs) Um, And he, and so he was like, okay. Um, And then, uh, you know, a few hours later, they, they announced the shutdown. So I was actually in my apartment. Um, And then, but then it was also like, it's so weird to like go back to that, like, time because it was also when like i thought they were gonna shut manhattan down like me too do you remember when that was a thing yeah i got so out I, I threw my dog in the car and was like let's get out of here uh for yeah, a minute same so i booked a flight um to florida because i had friends down there and so i just like packed a bag for two weeks without any you were like there's no COVID in florida this will be great <laughs> yeah i know i was i i went to florida and then i went to epcot because i was like disney doesn't close till sunday like let's go enjoy the park right. before they close right at that point it, we weren't to a mask i mean yeah you think i think guys the, there was a the, the one usher tested positive like right next to my gift shop where that was the first guy who got it and i was like it's here it's on the block and i'm still like shaking people's <laughs> hands and giving people hugs and you're like, what are you doing what are you doing oh god it's yeah so weird so crazy so- okay so then where are you now mentally headspace 10 months in are you like you've let it wash over you you're at peace with it you still hate the world tell tell me you everything. know i like i got um well so right Back in November, before this started, I had started a YouTube channel because I'm this huge Disney fan and I like wanted this outlet for Disney stuff. So I was like watching um, shows on Disney Plus and reacting to them. I do these like reaction videos and like it had gotten like some pretty cool traction and whatnot. And so then the pandemic hit and I was like, I'm going to like go 120 percent with YouTube. And then I was like, I'm really depressed. I can't do this. (laughs) You know, it's uh and, it's hard to I'll, fabricate if you're not really genuinely feeling happiness and optimism and joy. Right. It's a hard thing to fabricate. Very hard, yeah. And also, it just, I think for me, at the beginning of the pandemic, I just really, like, was forced to ask this question of, like, what kind of art are we creating? What is the purpose of this art? And that, like, when, you know, these Black Lives Matter movements are happening and there's so much real stuff happening in the world, like, I think escapism is a beautiful thing, but we also have to, like, meet the reality of what's happening and so I also got to the point where I was like, yeah, the, the videos that I make on YouTube are like very stupid and fun, but like, I think I need to just pause that for a second. And I didn't even realize that it was more for like me too. Like I needed to pause for a second and like do some homework and have some yeah. difficult conversations and whatnot. So, um, we, uh, so we were we were in Florida because uh, my boyfriend is a show director for Celebrity Cruise Line in Miami. So we okay. we were quarantining with friends in Florida, and then we had some friends in North Carolina and Winston Salem that were like, "We can take you in for as long as you need." And, and it literally, <laughs> we joke all the time. Right. Was on Facebook, I was like, "How long can we stay with you? Like a month? <laughs> like?" Two months, like I was trying to be really generous. Cut to like five months later. Oh, my um, God. you know, <laughs> and it was great. Like we had a great time. But then, when the, what ended up happening is we just moved here, 
um, because of we just like felt comfortable here in the city and it's so so cheap and affordable um, and I was like let's just like go back to Winston-Salem and ride it out until things resume yeah yeah and then it'll you know whenever it comes back you'll come back or you know whatever it's yeah it's right, this moment right. of just trying to give in to this is what it is and this is what the state of the world is and this is and it's all going to be fine and we're alive and and we'll figure it out Right. Yeah, it's obviously it's obviously a difficult time, but I think that so much good is going to come out of this. You oh, know? yes. Because um, like okay. I do. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You talk. Go. I just so um, I do uh, like I when I started my therapy journey like two years ago, which I'm like very, very passionate about. I like operate under this umbrella called systems therapy, which is so I do some private work and then some group work that's like amazing. And it's just all about like these human systems that you know, we form in the world. And so I just keep looking at like the system of Broadway and how old this system is that we've all been like functioning under. And when something disrupts the system, it has to really rebuild itself. And it, yeah. and it will just to survive, it will adapt, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that aspect is really exciting because <clears throat> there are some things that I think needed to change, you know. Yeah. And it's, and it's a long enough shutdown that it really, now people have no excuse to to not change. You know, you're like, right. well, no, there's plenty of time to be planning and figuring all this out and and doing all of that. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm ex I'm very excited to see what can be implemented, what can change, what's I, I'm interested to see what stays the same uh, and how fast things come back and 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 what the convergence of all of that looks like. I'm literally oh, just right. trying to turn plug Broadway back in, plug theaters and tours back in, but then also. How do you incorporate everything we've learned and the growth we've had while well, we've had this moment to kind of sit and uh, sit in our thoughts? How do you then apply all of that? So it's it's going to be a, a I think it'll be an incredible time to be part of the industry, even though right now it feels like the most insane thing to be part of an industry that has no there's no end in sight or no totally. return in sight. It feels crazy. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. also, you know, like I think that we all as a, as you know. For those of us, for those of us that feel like a part of this Broadway community, you know, like what do we, how do we contribute to this as well, you yeah. know? And like, I know that like I've started writing and like just trying to like do some stuff because I'm like I want to be a part of where this goes, mm -hmm. um, you know. So yeah, yeah, you want to, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. You, how do you, as an artist, how do you, what's your translation or how do you interpret? any feelings or things or, you know, how do you interpret this moment? Because you can't just, you know, I think initially it was like, well, we'll just ride it out and, you know, a couple months will go by and then we'll all go back to the lives that we were living, which were very busy and insane and weird and chaotic and right. theatrical. Um, and so this is, it gives you a time to, I was like, we can't all just like, that's what I said. I waited for seven weeks and hated my life for seven weeks. And then was like, I got to do something. I've got to create. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I'll just make some merchandise. That'll get me through. I'll yeah. make a I'll make a video series and talk to my friends. It'll be great. And yeah, so you yeah, just yeah. have to, you just have to get through and, and use the moment however you want, you know, um, it, to whatever you can do to not go insane, I think is the, is the bare minimum. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, you're a dream. Um, we should, how do we follow you if we want to follow you? Is Instagram is a thing that we should do? Is that the best? Yeah. Yeah. You can follow me on Instagram. Um, and I have the same handle on Instagram, Twitter. I also just started a TikTok. Um, oh my God. <laughs> trying to do oh the TikTok. <laughs> I can't wait to go and watch that. Yeah. I don't know how and to then, do TikTok, but I'm working right. on it. Oh, now that I've like dived in like people are brilliant on tiktok yeah like, people are too people smart. are so so smart and creative like it's yeah. fun um and then also i have this youtube channel that if you're yeah how do we them, yeah what's that should how do we do that it's just what is, if you just search my name or i think if you just do youtube.com slash my name jacob heron okay. um it should come up um, i actually just picked the url like yesterday so that's what i'm not sure but i think it's jacob heron not jacob d heron Okay, but, we'll find you. Um, yeah, you search my name. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. You are um, a, a bright ray of light. Thanks for um, for uh, oh, shining up you. our uh, Saturday, and I'm glad you're figuring it out and making this work in in Winston Salem. And then um, you know you'll get back, and and then it, we'll be running to each other on subways after your show, and it'll be like we never left. I know. I always loved bumping into you. Yeah. I had like just my my apartment that I had 
moved into, I bumped into you right after I saw it. And I was like on cloud nine. I was like, I yeah. just saw this apartment. Oh my God. Uh -huh. like, I, yeah. I probably seemed like a crazy person when I saw it. No, it was, <laughs> it, well, it was a, it was a nice apartment. I was like, you showed me a picture. I was like, yes, I would also do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I remember bumping at you on the train after Mormon. I said, how's your show? It was good. Uh, you said, I'm actually, I'm working, because um, I've done Mormon so long, I'm thinking of other things and I'm working on this. I think I'm going to create this YouTube thing. And I remember saying, do it. Whatever you can do, create. Yeah. Uh, make sure you create because that's, it, you get stagnant when you do just the same thing over and over, even if you're like living your dream. Um, I said, right. create whatever it is. And, you know, and then to watch you create something and then it instantly becomes successful. I was like, well, duh. But <laughs> I was like, well, it doesn't always work like that. Me 10 years later being but like. You, well, you are always a source of inspiration to me. And I know Deidre as well, just because like what you've created at like, you you just, it's it's hard to imagine Broadway up close not existing, honestly, because it's just like right. filled such this amazing like spot that like, I don't know why nobody had done it before you, you know? Right. Like, that's what I always think of great, when I see great ideas, I'm like, Oh man, like why didn't no why didn't I think of it? Like yeah, you know, but, you've, but you've also just put in so much hard work and you just do such a great job. And it's so inspiring to to see Thank what you. you've done. You're a dream. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh and that night we I remember we walked onto the train in a packed train. Remember those? And we were yeah. packed in like sardines, and there was a woman who said, saw oh, she saw my playbill because I had just seen the inheritance. And um Yes. And it like, oh, it, you know, it was part two and I, oh, it's, I loved it. And it, and we got on the train and you were like, how was that? We have the same show, show schedule. So I don't know if I'm going to get to see it or whatever. And the woman was like, oh, I'm in that. I cover, I yes. cover Lois. Yes. I'm the female standby. And she was talking to us about Matthew Lopez who wrote it and his, the way he writes. And I just thought like, one of those, as you're like, you can't breathe and everyone's yeah. like sweating on you. I remember that, it, that train ride in, like specifically was like so packed. I remember being like this close to you and being like, yes. I've never been this close. No. To, like, anybody you're just life. like, you're like, yeah, tell us more about the show. Like, I'm sure you're great. You're just like, and this was just another Saturday. You were like. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's moments like that. I'm like, how do we ever go back to that moment where we're like, right. it's rush hour, guys. It's totally fine that this woman is literally inside of me right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, this is different. This is very different. Um, so it's, uh, I long for, as insane as they are, I long for those moments. So soon enough, we're going to be packed uh, nose to nose talking about our insane lives. So I, I look forward to that. Um, You're a dream. Thanks for spending a little piece of your Saturday with us. Um, good luck with the rest of this insanity. And um, like I said, before you know it, one day closer, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll bump into you in Times Square and we'll laugh about the insanity of this moment. Yes, 100%. Your dream. Right. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Yeah, bye. Take care. He is uh, really from the moment I met him. That this the Heron family. I have to tell you about this family. Um, they are an interesting tribe of humans uh, with different kids. Who and the dad is so sports, and and the family is so sports. But then you have these two children who are like, you know, uh, the Swiss Family Robinson or Sound of Music children who are just like the most talented people ever, and are just like this is just what we do. And I was like, but it's not what you do. Your family's so like, so sports. Um, so it, it, it's been an interesting ride to watch them navigate New York city and careers and families. And uh, it's really, it's been a joy to watch because uh, you know, to have a couple siblings, both in the game and, and to know them in their together in separate lives is to me, it's always a, a very fascinating moment of our industry of families and siblings in an insane industry. I hope on the journey that you're starting to put together uh, the the patchwork of different careers and how it can all arrive to a moment of of standing on a thing and singing hello uh, on a Broadway stage. Um, I'm so fascinated by the culmination of a life, uh, of a human life in something they're building, whether it's a career, whether it's a theater in 1904 and your name's Oscar Hammerstein. But to me, that is what makes the world go round. It's what makes New York City what it is, and it makes our industry what it is. So of course you see the performers on stage, but the, the amount of people in that building that are all pursuing separate careers and separate lives, uh, to me, that's the most fascinating thing is the humans. Uh, of course, you're gonna get history. Of course, you're gonna get some ghost stories in there as well. 
but the fabric of people embarking from a place to a tiny 13 mile island that's in the middle of two rivers on solid rock. And we all sit down our suitcases uh, and we all just try to make a life here to me um, it is fascinating. So I hope you, uh, thank you for being on this journey and hopefully being as fascinated by this as I am, uh, which is why you're here, I think. Uh, we sold out of every ornament. You guys are, <laughs> I can't, I have to, I have to just tell you that I made these marquee ornaments and I said to my graphic designer, this isn't one of my better ideas. This is a passion project. I'm obsessed with these buildings. I'm going to make these. They're going to be our level of quality that we we'll always do. And when I launch these and they do not sell, I want you to tell me, remember you said these weren't going to sell. This is a passion project that you're doing for a year, for 10 years, and you're insane. And then we launched them and they started to sell really well. And then I couldn't keep up and I was like, well, well, I'll just keep making them. And then it got insane and I ran out of every material I have basically in New York City and I made more ornaments than I've ever made in my entire life this, this week. And we sold out of every single ornament. And I have to just say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for making my life insane and my fingers like hurt from gluing all these little tiny Richard Rogers letters to pieces of wood. Um, but I, without you guys, I wouldn't be making it through this. Uh, I wouldn't be smiling as large as I smile. I wouldn't be sitting in front of this 1910 brick wall as much as I do. And so I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being uh, any small part of this insane, weird part of our lives that is extending way longer than any of us thought and for showing up every Saturday and for buying an ornament uh, and hanging out in your tree and taking a picture and sending it to me and, and making my day. Um, for those who are just joining us for the first time and are like, what is he talking about? So our gift shop is, should you be interested, broadwayupclose.com forward slash souvenirs. Um, almost everything is handmade or it's at least hand designed uh, by me and my graphic designer, Chris. And so uh, when our gift shop reopens, we're, it's basically gonna be an Etsy store, but in the most commercial place in New York City, all, all handmade and, and we're making plans to to, to build out a, a larger production facility for that uh, so that um, next year, I don't know that I'll be single-handedly gluing all the letters. Um, but thank you for, for being a part of all of that. Uh, if you're interested in uh, purchasing anything, here's a discount code of $5 off. Uh, put in Broadway 5 and you'll get $5 off. And then, if you, of course, if you want to follow us, Broadway Up Close is where you follow us for all of your fun facts here on Facebook. Give us a little like uh, YouTube uh, every Sunday, the entire week of fun facts and our Saturday noon on Broadway interview gets loaded there. So uh, make sure to check all of that. Subscribe, notifications, do all of those things that you all know how to do better than I know how to do. Uh, officially, uh, every day I wake up and I say one day closer to Broadway. You know, it's my mantra. I hope it's your mantra. It's one little silver lining of optimism that is going to get us to whenever this insanity uh, and the shutdown ends. And so um, that little bit of uh, little orphan Annie sun will sh come out tomorrow. Optimism is, uh, I think, is what we got right now. So keep chanting, keep saying it, keep following up, uh, keep checking in. You guys are awesome. Uh, I love you all. Happy Saturday noon on Broadway. And I'll see you again on Monday for our next theater, one of my favorites, probably one of Broadway's most underappreciated theaters, but uh, a theater that has my heart. So uh, I hope to see you then. Thank you again. Have an enjoyable rest of your weekend. And we are now officially one day closer to Broadway. I love you all. Bye guys.